Hello and welcome to today's Solanus Insight webinar talking about a digital approach to improving cooling system performance. My name is Jerome Coppers. I'm the marketing manager for the Industrial Water and Technologies Division for Europe, Middle East and Africa. I'll be your facilitator for today's meeting. I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. This is a Microsoft Teams live event, so you are in listen only mode. We will have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end of the presentation session. If you'd like to ask a question, please type in English in the question and answer panel on the toolbar. This webinar is also being recorded. First, allow me to introduce you to our speaker, Mick Murphy. Mick has worked for Solanus and his predecessor companies for almost 40 years and is currently an applications engineer specializing in cooling water treatment. During his time with the company, he has held consulting roles and leadership positions in research and development and laboratory management. He possesses a strong technical background in industrial water treatment, corrosion science, and monitoring and control technologies. Mick holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry from the University of Sheffield in England and a Master of Philosophy in Corrosion Science from the University of Derby in England. Mick will take us through his presentation, A Digital Approach to Improving Cooling System Performance. At this time, I'm handing it over to Mick. Thank you, Jerome, for that nice introduction. Uh, in today's discussion, we're going to cover a few topics. First of all, I'd like to have a brief introduction of Solenis so that you know who we are and what we do. Then we'll have a little bit of a look at the importance of heat transfer and the challenges faced in industry as a general. Then we'll go on to look at fouling and its impact and how we can see that changing. We'll look at managing and monitoring fouling with on-guard analyzers, the 3H analyzer and the 3B analyzer, before looking at moving beyond simple monitoring. And finally, as Jerome said, we'll have some question and time for questions and answers. Before I begin, I want to make a very simple statement. There are few industrial processes that are as common or have more importance than the transfer of heat. And I'd like at the end of this presentation for you to feel that the time you've invested in exploring the ways to manage or improve heat transfer is time well spent. So, a little bit of an introduction to Solenis. We're a leading global producer of speciality chemicals for water intensive industries. And hopefully you can see there's a, a broad list of those industries that we support on this slide. We supply chemicals to help cooling and boiling. We help uh, our customers wastewater plants and we treat reverse osmosis plants and process applications. We're not a new company by any means. We have a legacy of 100 years with companies such as Drew and Betts, Ashland Water Technologies, Hercules and Stockhausen. We've been around a long time. Our name may have changed, but we haven't. There are 5,200 people working for our company. Over 1,300 of them are in the field, helping our customers directly. And we serve customers in over 120 countries, from 39 manufacturing facilities, four R&D centers, and 11 application laboratories. We're one of the major providers of water treatment to industry. Because we're a major provider, and because we're in a lot of industries, we get an insight into what our customers are facing. Their industries are becoming far more complex. This is happening very quickly. But also their employees are becoming more comfortable with and are expecting to use digital tools to help them in their work. The impact of the COVID pandemic has been driving these impacts even further. And we've seen a need for more data, for autonomous operation, and for remote monitoring coming more and more to the fore, thanks to COVID and its impact. Sensors are becoming much more available, more cost effective and able to detect more parameters. 
And we're seeing a development of data and analytic strategies within our customers. They're wanting data because they want to use that data to improve the way their processes work. Our customers are also looking to operate and solve problems in new ways that attracts new talent to their industries. Put very simply, the world is changing very quickly. However, there are solutions out there to help manage this change. I mentioned how heat transfer was vital to industry. And in fact, there are a few functions more critical than the transfer of heat to or from a process. Because without this ability, many processes become inefficient or in some cases impossible. And this is reflected in the fact that the global sales of heat, equip heat transfer equipment exceeded $16 billion in 2019. And this demand keeps rising. We need to improve heat transfer continuously because there's a drive to increase tr productivity in increasing plant. We have new and more demanding applications appearing every day. And in parallel with this, we see increasing regulatory requirements and economic pressure to recover and reuse waste energy. Heat transfer is vital to industry and getting it right is vital. We do have challenges this, on this, however. We have limited capital available for improvements. We're seeing fewer maintenance opportunities and shorter plan shuts. And the increased use of degraded water systems, sources and water reuse. We see a loss of experienced personnel and staff ability is reduced. And ultimately, older plant is being operated beyond its design capability. The result of all of these factors is an increase in fouling in heat transfer systems. Fouling is the buildup of deposits. It's a result of chemical or physical or biological processes. And it's the number one reason for reduced heat transfer efficiency. But it's not just that. In addition, fouling encourages colonization by microorganisms. So where we see fouling, we see microorganisms either aiding that fouling or taking advantage of it. And fouling promotes localized corrosion cells. It promotes under deposit corrosion and localized attack. But most important of all, fouling promotes the growth of further fouling. It's a vicious cycle. So where we see fouling, we see continued growth of fouling. Where we see fouling, we see colonization by microbes and we see the potential for corrosion increasing considerably. And these have an impact on many factors. So if we just look simply at operational cost, the initial cost of building a system has to take into account that fouling may occur. And you can see here, that typically we're seeing 50% extra costs in some cases just to allow for fouling on heat exchanges. We see an increased demand for maintenance, reduced plant operational life, and increased working hours to repair these uh, pieces of equipment. Our capital costs increase because we have to have this plant fouling allowance, but we also have to pay for cleaning equipment to be built in and for backup equipment. There's an increase in energy demand, simple things like a resistance to flow, but also the fact that if we can't recover waste energy, we have to use backup energy sources, which cost a lot more. And in order to treat the fouling, we increase water treatment demands and we use cleaning chemicals, all of which add cost to the, to the operation of a plant. Ultimately, if we have under deposit or microbially influenced corrosion, we have replacement costs. But it doesn't just impact on the cost of plant. Poor heat transfer reduces plant productivity. A single unplanned shutdown in a chemical producer in the UK cost over half a million pounds worth of lost product in 2018 simply down to severe biofouling on heat exchanges. Shutdowns 
both planned and unplanned, are extremely expensive and impact directly on production. But if we have a shutdown, we often end up with a startup delay to follow that, which again impacts directly on production. If we have reduced cooling and heating capacity, we get reduced throughput, but also we can impact on the quality of our product as well. So having poor heat transfer directly again impacts our productivity. When this mentality gets in that heat transfer is likely to result in a shutdown, then we start building up reserve stocks which cost money, or we have pre-shutdown production pressures, which again impact on production on a plant. And ultimately on-off production and bottlenecking means we get directly reduced output from a plant. Ultimately, we miss opportunities. We have inflexible production and a slow response to demand down to this heat transfer bottleneck. Environmental issues are coming to the fore more and more. And typically, we will try to, ex to manage our heat transfer so we get the best from it, so we minimize our environmental impact. With poor heat transfer, we often see an increase in CO2 release because heat recovery is minimized and we have to use backup energy. You can see here that a typical 200,000 barrels per day refinery will see an increase in its energy demand that results in over 60,000 metric tons of CO2 emissions a year, simply down to fouling. Often, fouled exchanges result in poorer quality water discharge. So because we're having to use more water treatment, we end up putting out polluted water and we end up with higher treatment costs. When we clean exchanges, there are waste chemicals and spent cleaning chemicals to get rid of. And this again is an environmental impact that we could avoid. Reduced cycling and limited reuse of degraded water means that we increase our water consumption, impacting on the local environment yet again. And something that is very, very important, we can find that fouling will result in health related issues. Legionnaire's disease being the most commonly known, but we operate a fouled exchanger in a less than safe manner. So health issues are likely to follow on from fouling. There are many types of fouling. Typically, we'll see scale formation where we start to see insoluble materials dropping out of solution and coating heat exchange surface. They have a quite a high impact on the heat transfer, but also simple deposition of particulates like grits and salts can drop out into low flow or stagnant areas. And again, they can have a moderate to high impact on, the, on heat transfer. By far and away, the worst impact on heat transfer is biofouling, where slime and debris production by microorganisms produces a strongly insulating layer on the surface of the heat exchanger. And finally, in many chemical industries, we'll see a buildup of hydrocarbons or oils or greases from the water phase falling onto the heat exchange surfaces and having a moderate increase, uh, a moderate impact on insulating uh, power. We can control these things, and this is normally done in one of two ways, either through an online control measure by the addition of water treatment, or by taking the plant offline and removing it with cleaning chemicals. Now, normally offline is something that we only do in the worst possible case, that we have no choice in the matter. But even online control measures demand a lot from the plant, from the treater. Selenis do offer these solutions to fouling, but we'd far better, we'd far rather treat your system so you don't get fouling in the first place. Because managing fouling, one of the key things about that is that the best approach is to stop fouling at the earliest opportunity. I did mention that once you have fouling, you increase the rate of fouling. You make fouling more likely on top of existing fouling. So if you can stop fouling at the earliest opportunity, you slow down the further buildup of fouling. And that means you have less impact on the process. And once you have fouling under control, you'll find that you have lower costs and it's easier to achieve good results with treatments. Normally, if we have control of fouling, we can manage fouling online. 
And that means less operator involvement. This means we can do this remotely rather than having to have cleaning crews involved and people checking and rechecking equipment. But to achieve this best approach, we need a couple of things. The first thing is an effective cleaning or dispersing treatment, something that is actually able to control the fouling. And then we need to be able to adjust that treatment based on its performance. Just blindly adding treatments to control fouling is not enough. We have to know we've had an impact. And that leads to the most important factor. You need a way to detect and measure fouling before it becomes established. Because once it becomes established, you get worse and worse conditions and things become harder and harder to control. For this, we need the ideal fouling monitor. We need something that's going to help us detect that fouling. And there are several factors that are there in the ideal fouling monitor. First of all, it should accurately detect the fouling at an early stage. It's pointless telling us there's fouling there when it is almost impossible to remove. We need a fouling monitor that's effective and flexible enough to detect all types of fouling, not just scales, but also biofouling and oils. We need a fouling monitor that requires minimal or no operator involvement, especially in the days now during the COVID pandemic. We can't afford to have people pulled away to go and check fouling. We want something that runs by itself and is able to operate with minimal or no operator involvement. Our ideal fouling monitor should be representative of the process conditions. It shouldn't give you an estimate. It should give you something that is close to real life. And at the same time, it has to provide you real time monitoring because fouling events aren't constant. You can have a spike in fouling, which then dies away, or you can have a constantly increase in fouling. You have to be able to monitor real time. And finally, because we want to have minimal involvement, we must have remote access to that monitor. It must offer us remote alarms and trending and logging. This then would be the ideal fouling monitor. We've got several types now available to us in the field. We can go from the simplest approach, which uses coupons placed in a system, which are then removed, and there's a physical measurement of the fouling on the metal itself. We can look at pressure differential across equipment so that as fouling occurs, we can see an increase in differential. One of the most classically uh, used approaches is that of heat transfer, where a monitor monitors the amount of insulation taking place on heat transfer equipment. Some technologies use added dyes, where a change in dye activity gives you an indication of microbial growth or solid deposition. And finally, you can send people to a piece of plant to directly examine the foul surfaces. The problem with each of these is that none of them is the ideal fouling monitor. In some cases, for example, with the coupons, it has very little of the ideal fouling monitor in it. Heat transfer does offer us a lot of what we need. However, it's unable to give us the flexibility and unable to give us the absolute accuracy that we would like from a fouling monitor. And approaches such as visual inspection are so operator intensive, they're no longer attractive. The simple answer is that traditional approaches are just not able to offer us the ideal fouling monitor. We have to try something else, and this is where our OnGuard 3H and 3B analyzers come in. They, they are able to monitor that fouling directly. They give you a direct monitor, a direct measurement of fouling thickness. Their accuracy is extremely good. They're very flexible, able to detect biofouling, organic fouling, inorganic fouling, deposition, scaling to extreme accuracy. Because they're operated remotely, and because their operators, they are fit and forget, the operator involvement is extremely low. And they're designed to be representative of the conditions you're seeing in your cooling system, your heat exchanger in real time. 
you're able to monitor 24 7. There is remote access to this, whether it be wired or wireless. And because the results can be sent to the cloud, you can have a remote alarm and you can have trending recording all of the information 24 7. On Guard 3H and 3B are now offering you the ideal fouling monitor. The difference between the two is relatively straightforward. On Guard 3H Analyzer offers you real time scale and deposit monitoring in the system. Its accuracy is to the micron level. It gives you a fouling factor and fouling thickness determination automatically. And it gives you simultaneous monitoring of scale and deposition in that system. The 3B takes it another step beyond. It's able to give you real time biofilm and fouling monitoring and reporting. Again, you have the same micron level accuracy. And you're able to determine a fouling factor and fouling thickness automatically. But now you're able to simultaneously monitor inorganic, organic and biofouling with the same piece of equipment. The working principle is relatively straightforward. Inside the unit, a probe sends pulses of ultrasound through the liquid to the surface. It then times how long it takes for the um, reflection to come back to the probe. And by using that, it's able to calculate the amount of fouling on the surface. It's extremely accurate. It can detect as little as five microns of fouling. That's less than a 20th of the thickness of a human hair and is actually less than visible. It's automatic and real time operation, so it's able to run continuously and record results without operator involvement. And most importantly, this piece of equipment is resistant to real life contamination and conditions. So high skin temperatures, dissolved suspended solids, conductivity flows, all these are accounted for within the unit itself. It's designed to be representative of operational conditions. When we install a unit, we set it up so that the flows and the temperatures and the configuration is designed to mimic the heat transfer surfaces that you're looking at. And most important of all, this equipment is proven in the field. Let me give you an example. So this is a confectionery plant in the Emea. The systems that they use are used for cooling the chocolates that they produce on plant. However, the water quality changes rapidly. And often, if the change occurs, people won't notice this because site personnel have more than enough jobs without man manually going to monitor conditions on the plant. So what happens is that water conditions will change rapidly on the plant, scaling will occur, and then routine inspections will find that the plant is fouled and the inspectors will demand a shutdown for cleaning. This usually results in a loss of production and a delay to restart. But on top of that, it also results in a high volume of cleaning related waste and costs of waste disposal were considerable. Usually the issues on the plant were detected far too late for anybody to do anything about it. A clean was the only option. An offline clean was seen as a routine. So Lennis discussed what we could offer by using an OnGuard 3H. And we started logging the conditions on the plant. And it soon became very clear to us that we could actually detect the scaling before there was an issue. As soon as this happened, we could alarm, mon uh, let operators know of the conditions and send an alarm to them. So they could actually change the water quality going to that plant. The result was by using OnGuard 3H analyzers, they were able to reduce the need for cleaning by over 95% and reduce costs and increase productivity on the plant. The OnGuard 3H analyzer paid for itself very, very quickly. But it's not just a simple detector. One of the great things about the OnGuard systems are that they're able to be used for other things. So for example, 
in a, a large pharmaceutical plant in Scandinavia, we were able to use OnGuard 3B analyzers to monitor different systems that were suffering from biofouling. By monitoring different systems throughout the plant, we were able to identify the root cause of biofouling for the whole of the plant. And the plant was able then to put corrective action in place, which resulted in the prevention of biofouling. And no, they no longer had the need to clean their systems regularly. We were able to use OnGuard 3H units on sites to help in what if simulations. So for example, in a European airport, the operators were really concerned that high summer temperatures were likely to lead to scaling of HVAC units. By setting up a what if simulation and using the 3H unit on their system, we were able to show the operators of the airport that they could operate with our treatments with no problems, even if the summer temperatures reached the extreme. In a similar situation in the Middle East, an operator wanted to know what would happen if they increased the cycles on a district cooling system. By running an OnGuard 3H unit on that system during a trial increase in cycles, we were able to show they could save water use and have no impact on scaling in that system. It's also been used very widely when we have changed treatments on plants or taken over a plant. So, for example, we had a large plastics processor in the UK who decided to move to Selenis treatment, but needed some confirmation that fouling was going to be managed on a very critical system. Rather than waiting for months and examining heat exchanges after treatment had been in place for, say, six months, we were able to prove within days that fouling was under control on that plant. They had no need to worry. OnGuard 3H and 3B offer us the chance to monitor what is happening in real time, but they also offer us the chance to manage in real time. So by using the information that you can get from an OnGuard unit, you are able to develop treatments based on the conditions that are occurring. And here is a very early example of what we call performance based treatment. You can see here that without treatment, the water is showing a scaling tendency and the scale is being laid down on the unit quite steadily. This shows you also the accuracy by which we can actually monitor scale because at 57 microns an hour, we're not seeing a lot of material until many hours of exposure. Addition of treatment reduces this scaling rate to 40 microns an hour. But the standard addition is not enough under these severe conditions. Typically, nobody would ever know this until it was too late. But because of 3H's capability, we're able to say that we need more anti scalant. By increasing the anti scalant addition, we were able to manage this scaling, and scale deposition was reduced to almost zero. Beyond this, by removing this, the scale control, you can see again that the scaling starts to occur, but then we can recover that by adding high dosages of anti scalant We can actually start to clean scale off. And this is the core behind our performance based treatment. That if we can use the 3H or 3B analyzer to determine when deposit is being building is building up in a system, then we have the capability to respond to that by increasing treatment and removing that fouling before it becomes an issue. Performance-based treatment is based on monitoring fouling rate and responding to it. So if fouling rate increases, a response is initiated. In this case, let's say an increased addition of treatment. The result of that increased addition is monitored and addition rates are adjusted appropriate to the change in fouling rate. So if we see more fouling, we would increase addition of treatment further. If we see less, then we would reduce the additional rate of anti-fouling. If recovery occurs after that, the monitoring resumes as before and dosage is ramped downwards to a level where we have a stable fouling rate, one under control. But if recovery isn't possible, we have the capability 
to issue an alarm that something is not right, that something is going wrong in that system. The thing is, this alarm is occurring at a time when the impact on the system is still at its lowest. So the operator is now able to do something to improve the situation without having to shut the system for an offline clean. We're able to give performance based treatment and control. And if there are any issues, we're able to make sure that there is enough time to respond to it before there is a problem. Let's have a look at this in real life. This is an, a, a pulp mill in Europe where they're cooling a uh, condensing a condenser system. Now the process is very variable, but also the water quality is very variable. So we would often find that scaling would occur on this system due to spikes both in the water quality and the conditions of the system. The difficulty with this system is the only way to detect that fouling is taking place is through an annual inspection. And typically the annual inspections resulted in a need for an offline clean. And these were very expensive both to plant in terms of the cost of the clean, but also in terms of production as well. We installed on guard 3H to monitor the scaling, the fouling taking place on this unit. You can see here there's a chart and you can see the spikes and the troughs as conditions change. But you can see in that chart there's a point where scaling is really taking off. And by taking off, we've detected it at 10 microns, which is a small amount of scaling. But because we detected it earlier, we managed to increase the dosage automatically through performance based treatment, clean the scaling off, as you can see, and return the surface to clean. So there was no impact on the process and no scale buildup. And every time the scaling begins to spike, our unit was able to respond control the scaling, remove the scale and return the system to normal clean operation. And the result is clear. If you look at the two photographs with without on guard 3H, we would have a build up of scaling and fouling on the heat exchanger. But one year running with 3H and we still had a clear system. We had no scale at all. Interestingly, by monitoring the system and ramping up and ramping down scale anti scalant dosage, we actually found that the plant used less chemical because it was using just enough to do the job and no more. And because the scale was controlled at the end of the year, the system was clean. There was no need to do an acid clean, which saved over 80,000 euros. So ultimately, 3H gave the performance for that gave the system control and the performance the customer needed but it did it automatically and remotely there was no operator involvement here the algorithm ran itself in a summary on guard 3h analyzer and on guard 3b analyzer offers you the chance to improve system performance accurately in real time and giving you real control over what's happening in your system. The results of that are quite straightforward. You optimize the heat transfer that you have in your system. You have the capacity to reduce energy and water demands and you can protect the assets. And at the same time, it gives you insights into what's happening in your system without having the need to have people and um, engineers involved directly in monitoring and fixing issues. On Guard 3H offers you that chance to have the digital approach to improving your cooling system performance. I want to return back to that message I gave you at the beginning. I'm hoping that you feel the time you've invested today in this presentation has been of value to you because I really do believe that any time you invest in looking at new ways to manage or improve heat transfer on your systems is definitely time well spent. And with that, I'll return you to Jerome to talk uh, to take the Q&A. Well, thank you, Mick, 
for your very nice presentation. So we will now move to the question and answer section. So if you like to ask a question, please type in English in the question and answer panel on the toolbar. And I see we have several questions coming in from the audience. So let me ask you the first question, Mick. So what are the re requirements to run this OnGuard system? Okay, we need um, a source of water for starters. So we're obviously going to be monitoring what's happening within that, that system. So we need access to it. So a stab in into a system or a water source, which is representative of the system conditions. We also need a power supply. So we're looking at anything that's 100, to 100 volts to 240 volts and around about a maximum of 750 watts. And that's basically it, access to the system, access to power and basically a way of communicating with it. We can either use wireless or wired communication. OK, thank you, Mick. Um, another question here that came in is how robust is the probe? I'd say very robust. Um, I often joke that um, you could probably kill somebody with the probe. It's that solid. The, the probe itself is stainless steel and is solid state inside. It's not fragile at all. It's not like a pH probe or a conductivity probe that if you dropped it, it would destroy it. The, the OnGuard 3H is designed for industrial use. So the probe itself, I've never seen one damaged in use. It's that robust. OK, thank you, Mick. So here another question, which is I think a bit more technical about the program or the chemistry program. So the question is in case a zinc phosphate treatment, um, in case of a zinc phosphate treatment, is there an issue if the product is being dosed with an oxidizing biocide in the same pipeline, such as precipitation? And if yes, what causes it? OK, well, first of all, the material is resistant to oxidizing biocides, so we use it on uh, applications with bromine, chlorine, chlorine dioxide, ozone. We don't have an issue with uh, resistance to the oxidizing biocides. Where you're starting to see chemistry forming precipitation, so for example, if you add bleach with a zinc product and you have them mixing directly, you're going to get precipitation, which can lead to fouling. Now, the fouling monitor is designed to detect fouling. So if we start to see deposits building up, then it's no surprise that we may actually look at the chemistry involved. However, that would be useful for you because, for example, if you were doing such a thing as mixing a bleach with a zinc product, you're losing the efficiency of your zinc corrosion inhibitor. And we would actually go and investigate why you were mixing the two together because it's wasteful not only in terms of causing fouling, but also the zinc chemistry is expensive and to have it drop out means that you're wasting it. So it would help you in two ways. First of all, we could detect if something was happening and maybe look at it in terms of how we could improve things for you, but also we would be able to monitor what's happening to the system itself in terms of heat transfer due to that effect and give you a reason to look at it. OK, thank you, Mick. So the next question is how to differentiate between corrosion and under deposit corrosion at the surface of the mild steel coupon due to suspended solids and sand and why the deposit accumulate at the surface of the mild steel coupon and not at the copper coupon? It's interesting. There is some thought that um, microbial build up at the very lowest level so the micron level encourages deposition so you may have a very thin film of biology building up on a coupon which then makes material stick to it and form under deposit cells copper coupons have a degree of i would say biocidal activity there's a small amount of copper released from a copper coupon which reduces the growth of microbiology on the surface of a, cooper, a copper coupon and that may reduce the amount of debris that's collected there. But you have to also take into account that the corrosion deposits on a mild steel coupon are much looser and therefore allow more opportunity for the ingress of water 
Whereas on a copper coupon, normally if you treat it well, or even if it's only corroding slightly, it's a much tighter uh, corrosion deposit, and therefore you don't get that under deposit um, growth. Ultimately, you have to ask the question, why would such a thing occur? Why would you get under deposit corrosion? Because if you find out the cause for it, then you can look at a solution. The monitor may well tell you that things are happening on its surface, that there is fouling and there is a deposit buildup. But ultimately, we have to find out why and how would we be able to control that? Thank you, Meg. So the next question is regarding uh, algae growth. So the question is, <laughs> can yeah. algae grow in wet slash dry areas, be treated chemically, and the, dread, the wet dry areas are areas where the condenser water is not reaching constantly, like water droplets um, spray like patterns, or is physical cleaning the only viable solution? It's an interesting question, and I've had this asked several times. The first thing to realize with algae is that they need light to live. So if you have a system which is suffering from algae and you can shade it so you can reduce the amount of light impacting on that surface, then you'll start to see that the algae will die and you'll not have a problem anymore. If you can't shade an area, if you can't remove light from that area, which is a case many times that you just basically can't stop light getting in, then physical cleaning is usually the first answer. But I have seen um, people apply uh, local biocides uh, via sprayers and via painting. It's not a simple thing because it's not truly water treatment. It's a wetted area and wetted areas are always difficult because splash zones are both wet and dry. But normally I say if you see algae, look at the physical conditions first because they're usually the ones that are more um, amenable to uh, correction. All right, thank you, Mick. The, the next question is about the, the on guard 3B or 3H. And the question is, is it required to re-zero the thickness slash fouling reading in case of plant shutdown or relocating of the on guard unit to another site? That's an interesting one. And I would say it's good practice to re-zero and to clean the surface of the, um, the actual cell itself. So the target is where the uh, biofilm will build up or the uh, scale will build up. And if you're reciting it, it makes far more sense that at the same time you take the target off, give it a very brief clean to remove any debris or dried material and put it back in and re-zero it. It's good practice. You don't have to. We can sort of start from uh, a a level of scale, shall we say, or a level of biofilm. But don't forget the important factor about any fouling, that once fouling is in place, then it will encourage further fouling. So if we don't clean it, then we risk having a non-representative surface. We have a surface that's really likely to foul, and it could be that fouling conditions are actually far more gentle than you're seeing on the unit. So it's good practice to clean it. Yeah, thank you, Meg. So the next question is more chemistry related. And is there a reaction between free chlorine and pyro autophosphate? If so, how can this be prevented without reducing dosage amount? Orthophosphates are resistant to free chlorine. There's no direct re reaction in uh, normal water treatment. You won't see a breakdown of orthophosphate to uh, any of its oxidized um, chemistries. In terms of organic phosphorus compounds, some of the earlier phosphonates such as the uh, AMP phosphonate will react with uh, uh, chlorine. That's because it contains a nitrogen grouping in there, but it's that's rarely used nowadays. Most of the uh, phosphonates that are used out there are resistant to oxidizing biocides. So Orthophosphate, no, there is no direct reaction between that and chlorine and the phosphonates that do react are pretty um, rarely used nowadays. OK, thanks, Mick. So the next question is at which micron level of scale you start to worry about a serious scale problem? That's an interesting one. Normally, 
um, I would start to say if you if you're getting 100 microns of scale, you're starting to get problems. But what you want to be aware of is that if you're getting five and 10 microns and it's climbing 20, 30, you're encouraging it to get worse and worse. So it's far better that you do something early. The example I showed of the uh, test work that was done on the very earliest uh, performance based treatments showed you that if we react very quick, quickly, we can clean scale from a system before it has a problem, it causes a problem. Now that was the first ever direct evidence anywhere in the world of the cleaning impact of uh, anti scalance on very fresh scale. That we, it was the first proof ever that by reacting quickly, you could clean scale off and fouling off of a system before it became established. And so I would say if you if you do have hundreds of microns of scale, you're already making your life very difficult because it could be that you wouldn't easily be able to remove that scale. So I would say react as quick as you can and accept that, OK, if you have got some scale on there, you may well be able to clean it off online, but the longer you leave it, the harder it's going to be. Yeah, thank you, Mick. Uh, the next question is, uh, how does the Ongar 3H look like? I did include a, a photograph earlier. Uh, typically, you're looking at something that's uh, about a meter tall by about half, uh, sorry, by about 40 uh, centimeters by about 10 centimeters. So it's a, a stainless steel box. Inside that box, there is a flow cell and an emitter and a target. And there are control valves and uh, automated uh, temp uh, probes and uh, what have you to to give us the information on what's happening within that system. Um, it looks quite nice actually for a piece of industrial equipment, but it is relatively robust at the same time. We can supply photographs. That's no problem if people want to see what one looks like. OK, Mick, the next question is, uh, would it be possible to apply this kind of analyzer to reverse osmosis systems, for example? It depends what you mean by apply it. Um, it's not designed to actually go into the unit, but we could look at the concentrate and we could look at the um, permeate and the uh, rejects and see what's happening with them to see if scaling is occurring or likely to occur in those uh, waters. We can have a look even at the feed water and see what would happen uh, under the conditions that are taking place in the membrane. But we can't monitor directly inside the unit itself. It would be a case of having to adapt it slightly to look at the reject. I think that may be the best approach for it. OK, the next question is if the system detects scaling or biofilm, how does it manage the dosing? Inbuilt within the unit itself is an algorithm that looks at the amount of scaling and the scaling or the fouling that's taking place and the rate it's increasing. As the, the fouling increases, it monitors that, sees the rate, and once it reaches a particular level, it begins to increase the amount of chemical being added or even just at, start to add a little bit of acid, for example. Now, it will then monitor what happens because it does take time for things to change in a water. So it will add, increase the amount of treatment being added, then monitor. And if the rate isn't decreasing or becoming flat line or is, is starting to go out of control even further, it will then look at it and increase the chemistry again. So it will start to increase doses until it reaches a point where one of two things happen. Either it begins to gain control of the fouling that's taking place in the system or it recognizes that it has done so much that it can't be controlled, that people have to be alarmed. And this may this, this can be set up at any one of a number of levels. So for example, we can keep adding chemical up to a certain point and then send an alarm, or we can send an alarm if, for example, this is repeatedly um, keeping a high level of scaling, even though we're adding uh, high levels of treatment. So it depends very much on, on what we need from that system, but it is an algorithm that recognizes that scaling has increased, treatment is added to respond to it. And if the response isn't good enough, then it calls for human involvement ultimately. Yeah, thanks Mick. The key to remember with this is it's happening at such a level that even if it can't control it, you're still in the situation where you can still go in and recover the, the heat exchange performance of the system. 
with manual intervention by, for example, changing conditions or checking that things are working OK, you've not reached a stage where you have to shut the plant down. It's so early in the process. It's that accurate. Yeah, so the next question is if we can also use this system in seawater cooling. Yes, yes, I've seen it used in seawater cooling. OK, the next question, um, is it the same device if we have already seen a couple of years ago? There's been improvements, uh, particularly in the 3B and in some of the algorithms. So the technology is pretty much the same from some years ago when we originally launched the OnGuard 3S. Now that was more of a very basic fouling monitor. It went through various uh, iterations, becoming 3H, which allowed us to change conditions, and 3B, which allowed us to monitor biofouling and organic fouling extremely accurately. But it hasn't stayed at that. There have been quite a few changes to the software. There's been changes to the physical uh, construction of the unit. So this is a living um, technology. It's something that we're going to be developing uh, over several years now uh, and continue developing. OK, maybe the next question is, are both the 3H and the 3B options available in one unit? I don't think so, no, but you really wouldn't need that unless you were looking at something very strange. So in the 3B, the surface temperatures are designed to be in the, uh, the, uh, the levels that microbiology would like to uh, grow at. So for example, we might operate a, a 3B unit at say 28 degrees centigrade or 30 degrees centigrade. On a 3H, you may want to operate a surface temperature, say for example, at 60 degrees centigrade. But bacteria really wouldn't want to live at that temperature. There are very few that like to live at very high temperatures. So it's it's a little bit difficult really to imagine a unit that operated at 60 degrees centigrade and monitored microorganism growth. The key is you have to choose the thing that you're monitoring. So if biofouling is an issue and organic fouling is an issue, you may find that 3B is the best answer. But if scaling and fouling from inorganic processes are the main issue, you would probably be better going with a 3H. That being said, I have heard of people looking at 3H and 3B as separate units on the same system to monitor different parts of the system, but it's not common. OK, the next question is uh, we are using the 3H system um, and six of these systems are used in seawater cooling towers. Um, and the seawater is slowly destroying the um, stainless steel metallic metallurgy in in the system. Is it possible to modify the 3H system with plastic parts? It's something we could ask. Um, I've not really seen any issues. It's been the units have been used in some really uh, horrible conditions, um, but certainly we can have a look at that. It's 316 stainless and uh, titanium based, so it's pretty resistant. But it may be we need to have a look at maybe some of the more exotic uh, uh, super alloys. Um, it's a question that we can probably take forward and have a look at that for specific applications. OK, Mick, the next question is how bad will minor algae growth in the cooling tower affect the uh, performance? Uh, algae growth in a cooling tower it relies on light. So normally the biggest issues are seen on the decking and in the open areas of the sump. And uh, if you're really unlucky, you might get something on the packing if it's really open. Secondary to that, the algae can fall off and go around the system, but it won't live very long in a cooling system because there's no light for it to live there. So the result usually is that you have uh, health issues associated with the tower itself in the fact that the algae is a, a, a nice place for bacteria and organisms to live. But also secondary to that, if you do have organic material going into the tower from algae being washed off and slimes being washed into the system, you could end up with fouling within the system itself, which reduces heat exchange capacity considerably. I think with all of these, if it gets that bad, you really need to take a step back and look at the treatments and look at how the tower is being operated because sometimes um, there is a, a point where you have to start looking at physical answers rather than chemical answers to problems. Okay, thanks Mick. So we have a few more questions. Um, 
Can a 3H unit work in a media different from water, like a 25% sodium chloride brine or a pulp cooker? Yes, um, it's an interesting question and that's, that's very useful. The unit works by the propagation of ultrasound, so it times how long a, an ultrasound wave takes to go through a solution and back. Now, in a true solution such as sodium chloride uh, solutions, brines, the impact is pretty minimal and we do have the capacity built into the unit itself to automatically monitor conductivity and adjust itself to take uh, those uh, slight changes in propagation speed into account. If it's an organic solution, say for example ethylene glycol, that does have an impact but it's not a true solution. So what we tend to do where you have organic solutions is we, we tend to take a sample of the, the water and then manually adjust the uh, the parameters in the unit uh, before we set it up so we know that we've got that taken into account. Now in terms of a pulp mill the other issue is solids so solid materials can be present and this is one of the great things about the on guard systems. You can have extremely high levels of suspended matter and it will have minimal impact on the transmission of ultrasound. So if you can imagine uh, when we give our uh, colleagues training in use of this unit, we actually get them to take samples of grit and uh, samples of mud, stir it into water to produce these really terrible suspensions. And it shows them that the unit still works, even though they've managed to put in four or five spoonfuls of sand and mud into a water that's being uh, used to uh, uh, demonstrate how the 3H works. So in the pulp mill we may find there's a bit of impact, impact from the organic materials but the solids may not have as big an impact. It's a case in, in its extreme form we may actually have to investigate a bit more but I don't see there's a real reason why we shouldn't be able to use it. Okay thanks Mick. The next question, um, is there a software in the OnGuard that helps to model a particular heat exchanger? Yes, we can set it up so that we can monitor um, the conditions. That's the idea that we would, for example, if we have multiple tubes and we have a different tube configuration or we have different flows, then we can set this up and we model the Reynolds numbers and we model shear and heat transfer accordingly in the unit itself. It's not automatic. It's something that we do. We investigate the application and we, we then program the unit for that particular application. OK, the next question, how would you tell if there is scale or biofilm and can OnGuard tell the difference? Uh, OnGuard 3B can tell the difference to, between inorganic scale, organic fouling and biofilm. It's extremely difficult. Um, that's why we have a separate unit for this. If you can imagine the reflectivity to ultrasound of something like scale or rust or corrosion or fouling is, is really high. Organic materials are more jelly-like and so the reflectivity is less, but we have that taken into account in the 3B unit. And the worst one of all is biofilm, which is almost completely water, but we're still, still able to um, detect that. And the unit uh, will detect each one separately as part of its protocol. It, it will examine the, the surface, it will examine the waveforms coming back and it will say how much of each uh, part, uh, type of debris is there. So for example, it may say there's several microns of scale, uh, tens of microns of uh, biofilm. It would give you that differential and we've seen this on several systems where you, you actually will get a differential between inorganic, organic and biofilm fouling. So we can do that with 3B. Okay, thanks Mick. Um, is, are there any guidelines for the location of the monitoring system in a large circuit with several heat exchangers? I think the first thing to do is to recognize that there's usually one heat exchanger which is mission critical, that is the most stressed, that is the most uh, important to you. And we have software that will help you even with that. So we have uh, software called Hexival that will actually allow you to determine which is the most critical heat exchanger and the most stressed heat exchanger. And that's the one you model first. So we would go on and we would install the unit and mimic that heat exchanger first to see what's happening in the worst case. But often in a large circuit, we'll find there are several 
exchanges that are important that may not be critical. So after we've modeled the first one and we know that that's under control, we may use the unit and move it elsewhere to another exchanger and look at what's happening there. So we get a complete picture of the system. And this is what happened in the Scandinavian system that they literally walked the unit around their plant to find the source of the fouling in their system. And once they found that source, they could then get to the root cause of their problems and fix them. So it's it's useful in the fact that it's relatively portable. If you have an access to the water and you have access to power, then it can be moved there. We can even put it on skids to move it around a plant. OK, thanks, Mick. Uh, we, we've come to the last question. Hey. Um, <laughs> is, is, um, if the probe, is the probe affected by fouling? And if so, does it have an impact on the measuring measuring results? The interesting thing is that the fouling on, if you can imagine it's um, the probe is hitting a target and then the uh, sound wave is coming back. It doesn't impact the probe if fouling takes place on the ultrasound emitter because uh, solid transmission of ultrasound is far faster than uh, transmission through liquid. So we can have fouling build up on the probe itself and it doesn't impact on its accuracy because it's looking at the reflection from uh, emission to reception. That doesn't mean that you can have tens of millimeters of fouling on the surface of the probe. It's bad practice to have it dirty. So we do recommend if you've got severe fouling taking place in a system that it's removed and cleaned on a regular basis. But we shouldn't be getting severe fouling. We should be able to monitor and control things. So uh, um, short answer, no, it doesn't have a major impact, but I wouldn't like probes being left in without a bit of cleaning. That being said, I've seen it used on an ammonia system where fouling was so severe that uh, after several months we couldn't remove the probe without a lot of hard work because the fouling had built up so deeply around it. And that taught us a, a very powerful lesson that um, cleaning units is a good idea as well. OK, well, Mick, I would really like to thank you for your uh, presentation and uh, the Q&A session. So we have now come to the end of this webinar. Thank you very much for participation. If you have any further questions, please contact either your local Solanus representative or send an email to Mick or uh, myself. Uh, you see our email addresses there. And again, thank you for attending this webinar. Thank you.